We have been talking about MHC and MHC restriction. So this is sort of where we've been the last few class periods. If you remember, thinking about MHC and MHC restriction was really something that we were talking about because we were thinking about T cells and T cell responses. And now we have been able to talk about the T cell uh, response antigen. So we've seen the antigen of MHC plus peptide. So we've basically been talking about this antigen side here. Um, and now we can actually go back and start to talk about the T cell receptor um, and D cells of the T cell receptor to start thinking about T cell responses. So this is, in fact, going to be very much parallel to what we talked about before with um, the B cell receptor and sort of aspects of structure of the B cell receptor. Now we're going to be doing all of this for T cells. Uh, if you remember, there are multiple different types of T cells. Um, we've seen the CD4 T cell and the CD8 positive T cell. You also quickly saw NK T cells um, last time. And we can keep subdividing our T cells into many different ways. You will see a little bit about some different types of T cells as we go today. And we also need to think a little bit about the T cell receptor. You can see the T cell receptor drawn here with its uh, two chains, um, each of which contains two immunoglobulin domains. Each uh, has a transmembrane domain, um, et cetera. And you can see that that looks very similar to an FAB uh, from an antibody with the ability to bind antigen. However, as I mentioned to you when I talked about the T cell receptor previously, uh, the T cell receptor has a rather low affinity for its ligand of MHC plus peptide. So the T cell receptor um, we generally think of as having rather low affinity. Um, there was a question that day about sort of biological reasons for that, and the answer is yes, but it's something that's complicated that we'll think about later. Um, and as I told you a bit when I mentioned the low affinity of the T cell receptor before, and as you are going to see in more detail in the next couple of slides, the T cell receptor really is only able to work because it has some other proteins that help uh, to uh, stabilize the signal or to help improve the signal, help contribute to the signal. We are going to see some of them today, and we're going to see some of them later on. So the T cell needs a lot of friends. The T cell has a lot of sort of other molecules that are contributing to aspects of the signaling. Some of those are shown here. And these are some of the particularly important ones. Um, and this slide is really getting at, ooh, that's not right. This slide is really getting at sort of a key point um, about some of these proteins. Again, we are going to see some of these proteins in some more detail today. Some of them we're going to see in some more detail later. But I want you to understand the big picture difference between them today, which is that the T cell receptor also has some other proteins that work with it that are known as co-receptors, as well as some other proteins that are known as co-stimulators. And so this actually shows us the T cell receptor with co-receptors, as well as uh, co-stimulatory molecules or a co-stimulator. Um, the big difference here is whether the proteins are involved in helping the T cell receptor transduce its primary signal, sort of giving the, the, making sure there's an arrow coming from the T cell receptor of the signaling, or whether or not it's a 
separate signal that's sort of influencing the T cell receptor signal. So is it contributing to the cupcake or is it icing on the cupcake? <laughs> um, the the co-receptors are actually contributing to that main primary signal. The co-stimulators are going to be altering that primary signal in some way. Um, so they're going to perhaps be improving it. Um, it's going to actually be a slightly separate signaling cascade. All of the proteins I mentioned today are officially co-receptors. So we're going to talk about the co-stimulators in more detail later. Um, today, we're only going to talk about a couple of things related to co-receptors. We can look back at the T-cell receptor here. If you recall, when we talked about the B-cell receptor, we spent a little bit of time talking about general details of receptors and signal transduction. And when we talked about that, we talked about some ways the B-cell receptor was awesome and some ways the B-cell receptor was not so great. So if we think back to what I told you before, and you can in fact see a B-cell receptor on the left here, what are, what's the good part of the B-cell receptor as a receptor, and what are the problems with the B-cell receptor as a receptor? Yeah, Jamie. Um, having the kind of forced receptor region mm -hmm. allows it to bind to areas at once. Okay, so because we have two binding sites, that actually gives us, that can sort of improve affinity a little bit. Um, so that's nice. Um, how is this in terms of uh, specificity for a ligand? Is it very specific? Yeah, it's super specific. So in that sense of being a receptor, it's awesome. It's super specific for ligand. In fact, we go through all that work of EEJ recombination to make it super specific for ligand. Anything, but what about cons of the B-cell receptor as a receptor? Yep, Jamie. I mean, I suppose you could also consider the specificity to be a cons of the Maybe, we could, maybe, we're not going to go on that philosophical jaunt today. <laughs> um, there, there certainly could be a philosophical argument there. Um, but there, there are two other pieces that we noted that are a bit of a problem for this receptor. Yeah, Jamie. So I, I, I did a little compare and contrast when we talked about the B-cell receptor before with another kind of receptor called the receptor tyrosine kinase. And I told you there were three really important parts of a receptor tyrosine kinase. What were the three really important parts of the receptor tyrosine kinase? Yeah? The receptor, the tyrosine, the, the receptor, the tyrosine, and the kinase. So the part that actually bound ligand, the receptor, the tyrosine, which was a tyrosine on an, a cytoplasmic domain, an intracellular tyrosine, that could get phosphorylated, and a kinase that had enzymatic activity. So we had both a place to get phosphorylated and a thing to do phosphorylating to transduce a signal. And when we looked at the B-cell receptor, how did it compare to that receptor tyrosine kinase? On that front. I use this figure because it is drawn correctly on this front. What do we notice about this B-cell receptor? Yes, Sydney. It basically has no intracellular domain. As soon as it goes through the, the 
uh, transmembrane domain, this protein stops. There is no intracellular domain. So we got a great receptor part, but we have no intracellular section to get phosphorylated. I think it's actually, in reality, it's three amino acids. None of them are phosphorylatable. Like, it's really, there's no cytoplasmic domain. Um, and there's no enzymatic activity. So we got no tyrosine and no kinase, although we have a receptor. How did the B cell receptor solve this problem? You might remember some partner proteins called IG-alpha and IG-beta, also called CD79A and CD79B. So those were some proteins that didn't really have a cytoplasmic or an extracellular domain. They just had a tail in the cytoplasm. And they associated with the B cell receptor and provided an, a region to get phosphorylated. So the B cell receptor sort of had these partner proteins. All right, now let's look at the T cell receptor. How do we feel about the T cell receptor on the same front? What do you think are pros and cons of the T cell receptor with these same criteria? Yeah, Jamie. It looks like it also doesn't have much of a Yeah, same problem. No cytoplasmic tail. It's going to be a super useful receptor. Um, in fact, as you will see, it goes through VDJ recombination also to be generated. Super good at specificity, but really nothing going on in terms of signaling and cytoplasmic tail. So part of the co-receptor that we use for the, T cell, uh, the TCR is this co-receptor known as CD3. So CD3 is the partner protein that is used in the case of the T cell receptor. CD3 has six chains. CD3 has this dimer over here, which consists of a delta chain and an epsilon chain. CD3 has this dimer over here, which has a gamma chain and an epsilon chain. And CD3 has this dimer here, that is two zeta chains. This is actually a little bit of a better representation of it. You can see that delta, epsilon, and then gamma and epsilon each kind of have a medium-ish cytoplasmic tail, and they each are drawn with one of these yellow boxes. Those yellow boxes are called ITAMs. ITAM stands for immunotyrosine-based activation motif. And so these are not just any old cytoplasmic tail. There are sort of special domains in the cytoplasmic tail that contain a tyrosine that's ready to go and get phosphorylated. So that the T in ITAM is the tyrosine. Um, and you can see that zeta, and you can also notice that uh, delta epsilon, gamma, and epsilon have a little bit of an extracellular domain. You can also see zeta here, um, which doesn't really have much of any or extracellular domain, but it has a nice really long um, cytoplasmic domain with multiple ITAMs. So you can see zeta has three ITAMs. And so in total, the T cell receptor actually has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten ITAMs. It has ten places it can get be phosphorylated if it is hanging around with the CD3 protein. And 
the, the C3 um, set of proteins is so important for T cell biology. You can't have a T cell without CD3. The T cell receptor doesn't work without CD3. And when I want to look at a cell by flow cytometry and tell if it's a T cell or not, I just look to see whether or not it has CD3 on it. That's actually how we mark T cells um, in most situations. And so CD3 is a big part of the co-receptor. One other piece that I will just point out here is that this yellow box that's being shown is an ITAM, immunotyrosine-based activation motif. Guess what, what happens to the cell if you stimulate this receptor? Look at the name. Yeah, Rishi. They get activated because there's activation in the name. Immunotyrosine-based activation motif. There's going to be another thing we're going to learn about later in the semester called an ITIM, immunotyrosine-based inhibition motif. But this one's ITAM, activation. So this is going to be really helpful for the uh, CD3 um, to transduce this signal. One thing that immunologists wondered for a long time um, on the cell biology of this is also depicted here. And I always um, really like thinking about this piece of information because actually uh, one of my classmates in grad school is the one who did this experiment and showed this. And so like I remember being the first time he presented the data. So like every time I look at this, I'm just like, oh yeah, that was Matt. Um, so people wondered for a long time about how exactly this could work because different proteins diffuse separately in the cell membrane. So usually, if I have two different proteins that say don't have a disulfide bond here, this is our disulfide bond in the T cell receptor, if we don't have a disulfide bond holding them together, usually those proteins diffuse separately in the membrane. So one of them is diffusing over here in whatever direction, and one of them is diffusing over here in whatever direction, and they're just going all sorts of random ways. They're not usually next to each other. We always draw them next to each other. They don't usually hang out next to each other. And so usually, say, if this were the insulin receptor, which has two chains, they'd be diffusing around the membrane separately. If insulin came around, they would both get caught and they would suddenly get pushed next to each other where they're not normally next to each other. They're normally all over. They would get induced next to each other and that would induce their cytoplasmic tails being next to each other to have signaling. So it's sort of hard to imagine that in the case of the T cell receptor in CD3 because CD3 doesn't really have much of a extracellular domain, especially zeta. And it, there's no antigen. So it should be diffusing totally separately from the T cell receptor. Should be kind of hard for CD3 to actually help the T cell receptor out. But in reality, it turns out that these are a, one of a small set of um, proteins that do, will actually diffuse together in the membrane. So they all diffuse together in the membrane. And the reason why they do that is that in their transmembrane domains, they have a whole bunch of charged amino acids. Usually you don't have charged amino acids in transmembrane domains. But these have a whole bunch of charged amino acids. And they actually are at different levels. So some are higher than the others. And so the positive and negative charges actually hold all these proteins together. Um, and so this whole thing, even though it's made of separate proteins, um, because of, say, say, the D and the K and the E amino acids, all that are at exactly the right level in the plasma membrane, all will be able to diffuse together. Um, and so this sort of diffuses together as one big set, even though they are um, separate proteins. So this is how we get the tyrosine part here. But there's one other piece to the co-receptor that is really important. And the other piece to the co-receptor is something that we've already seen. Um, this is either the CD4 protein in the case of a CD4 T cell or the CD8 protein in the case of a CD8 T cell. You've already seen CD4 and CD8 as proteins that bind to the MHC molecule. So you can see that CD4 
binds to sort of this back area of MHC class two um, to stabilize the interaction. So it does. So it's okay that peptide MHC plus TCR have kind of lower affinity because you have this additional stabilizing protein. Same thing, CD8 binds to the back of class one, so we have this additional stabilizing protein. Sort of how we have class two goes with CD4 cells, class one goes with CD8 cells because of that biochemical interaction. So that's super important in terms of sort of the outside of the cell, but it turns out this is also really important for the inside of the cell. Um, because CD4 and CD8 basically travel with a kinase that is associated with their cytoplasmic tail. It's not the same protein, but it does, it hangs out with, with CD4 or CD8. Um, you can see a kinase here listed as LCK. If we are being completely technical, um, this is a member of a family of kinases. Um, technically, the one that's on CD4 and the one that's on CD8 are different, but they're both members of the same family. If we think of them both as LCK, that's fine, although technically it's just LCK, CD4 has LCK. Um, and so what happens here is when, so normally the T cell receptor plus CD3 is diffusing around the membrane, doing its thing, and CD4 with its friend LCK is diffusing around the membrane, doing its thing. However, if MHC plus peptide comes around, we now bring CD4 into proximity of the MHC plus peptide. This brings that kinase LCK into proximity of the T cell receptor and CD3. You can see the CD3 molecules here as well as a T cell receptor. And now LCK can add phosphate groups to all of those ITAMs. And so now you can see the ITAMs have all gotten phosphorylated. They have the pink dots. They didn't have pink dots before. Um, and this is all because LCK was brought into proximity. And so the, so the co-receptor is really important for helping to provide the T cell receptor with both the places to get phosphorylated, the tyrosines, and the kinase. And so either CD4 or CD8, as well as CD3, are the members of the uh, T cell receptor co-receptor. Um, so that's kind of the general idea of T cell receptor signaling. There is, uh, and the T cell receptor is very specific for a particular peptide plus MHC, but there is one exception to that rule. And so this is, a, this is the one exception to that rule um, detailing TCR signaling, um, it's not a good time. As in, like, it's not a good time if it happened to you. It's fine to learn about. Um, because this is the situation where there are something, there are things known as superantigens. You do not want to encounter a superantigen. If you encounter a superantigen, you will not feel super. And so a super antigen is a protein that is made by some kind of uh, microbe, um, bacteria or virus, generally is gonna make the super antigen. And the super antigen is going to have the ability to actually grab onto the beta chain of a T cell receptor, as well as an MHC class one or class two, and just pull them together and hold them together whether or not the peptide matches. In fact, whether or not the MHC and the T cell receptor match at all. No more matching needed, the superantigen can just pull them together. In fact, in a lot of structures, superantigens are drawn as looking like a staple. Just sort of stapling together the T cell receptor and the MHC. Um, usually you can see the T cell receptor is binding to what's shown here as a V beta segment. Um, so a variable region of the beta chain. Um, and that's the only thing that it's specific for. It just puts, it can take T cells and just uh, have them interact with, class, with MHC. This is really bad. Because there are situations where you might have, say, 20% of the T cells in your body that are getting affected by a superantigen. You might look at this and say, 
this seems dumb for a microbe to do. Why is a microbe turning on T cells? Because this turns the T cell on. Yeah, Jamie. Yeah, that's sort of an underestimate. <laughs> so the idea here is that we are basically, again, you are going to turn on 20% of the T cells in your body, which may or may not be specific for the virus. You are going to have so many cytokines. You are, your, your body, your immune system is going to be in like disaster mode. Dealing with that one little microbe is going to be a minor issue because you're going to be just making all the cytokines <laughs> from all the T cells. There's going to be, you know, kind of a lot of confusion, a lot of activation. Just everything's going to be going wrong. Um, and so this can actually allow the, that microbe to um, sort of avoid immune responses. Um, there are super antigens that are made by a number of different microbes. Um, the most famous of them are from um, different Staphylococcus species. Um, and so these are some of the Staphylococcus species. Um, they bind to different V beta regions. Um, and by and large, they are uh, pretty dramatic causes of food poisoning. This is when you eat something, you eat a bacteria, it has, say, a pre-made protein. The protein's already made. As soon as it gets into your body, it starts activating T cells. And you feel like disaster. Um, that's usually a staph enterotoxin. Um, the, uh, the most famous uh, super antigen is toxic shock syndrome toxin, um, which is, again, um, made by um, some bacteria um, and uh, is a toxin that will induce excess inflammation, uh, excess signaling. Um, and so these are sort of the exceptions to kind of what I've been mentioning to you before about the nice specificity of T cell receptor signaling. Um, so usually T cell receptors are specific. This is the exception. Um, there is some data that is being debated. Uh, I'm not going to say it's clear yet. It certainly is not clear to me yet um, that SARS-CoV-2 may have a super antigen, um, which may be part of uh, the issue with some of it. But um, again, at least at least I am not yet feeling certain about some of those data, and that's something that I need to take some more time to look at. But that is one thing that is being discussed right now. So um, if we do not have a super antigen, then our T cell receptor will be nice and specific in terms of its binding of MHC plus peptide. And so for the rest of the time today, we're going to be talking largely about aspects of the T cell receptor. So the T cell receptor um, has these two different chains. They're drawn here as alpha and beta. Um, sometimes they are actually known as a heavy chain and a light chain, and we'll see why that is. We'll also see why that is that I am avoiding always saying alpha and beta right now. Um, they both have a transmembrane domain. They both have um, the immunoglobulin domains. You can see that the variable regions, so there's a variable and a constant in both cases. The variable regions have these nice little loops at the end, the three loops of the CDRs, or complementarity determining regions. You can see my CDR loops here. And those are actually making contact with the MHC plus peptide. So CDR3 is right here. Um, it's kind of in the middle, really touching the peptide. You also see, you can see contacts with the uh, MHC and the peptide with our other CD, uh, CDR loops. So it's all very similar to what you've seen with how, say, an FAB binds to its antigen. Also, really similar to something you've already seen before, the T cell receptor is formed by BDJ recombination. Um, there was a period of time where immunologists um, had figured out BDJ um, some details of um, how this all worked in terms of VDJ in B cells. And there was a question, uh, they hadn't yet, yet found the T cell receptor gene. Sort of, there was this question of like, how, is this, how does that T cell stuff work? What's going on with the T cells? And I think that my impression when I talked to people who were sort of in the field at that time is there was a little bit of dread. 
like, oh my gosh, we already learned this really hard VDJ combination thing. Do we have to learn another thing? And they were really excited when they found out that it was the same thing. Um, so it's really very similar. Today I'm going to show you the places where VDJ recombination differs in T cells, sort of hit the highlights of the differences, but a lot, the vast majority of what we see is the same. Um, I also forgot to tell you this just sort of fun fact um, when I talked about the stuff before. So RAG1 and RAG2 are only expressed in B cells and T cells, um, which are the only cells that have this great diversity process. Um, there is some friendly rivalry between immunologists and members of um, other biomedical fields, in particular um, neuroscientists. There's this immunology v. neuroscience thing sometimes. The neuroscientists, oh, they want RAG1 and RAG2. Oh, they want them so bad. Um, in terms of having a mechanism that allows for massive diversification of large numbers of cells. They really want to find RAG1 and RAG2 working in their cells somewhere to give diversification. The one they like to look the most often for is in the nose for olfactory receptors, for all the different reasons why you, how, the ways you can smell all the different things, because that's not really clear. So every so often you'll hear people thinking about, you know, is, are RAG1 and RAG2 in the nose? And the answer is no. They're just in T cells and B cells, at least as far as we've seen. Um, so there was, you know, a little piece of time where people were like, oh my gosh, are T cells going to be a whole different diversification process than this B cell thing we already learned? Happy news? No, they are not. <laughs> One of the chains contains a V, contains V, D, and J segments, and so that's why that chain gets called the heavy chain. One of the other chain only includes the V and the J segments, and so that's called the light chain. And so here you can see beta, um, our heavy chain, and alpha, our light chain. You can see that we have multiple V segments, multiple J segments coming together to make alpha and to give us this light chain of alpha. You can also see that we have multiple Vs, um, some Ds, and some Js coming together to make um, TCR beta. Um, so again, looks very similar to what we've seen before. Um, if we try to map the complementarity determining regions, um, they map to basically the exact same places that they mapped to in um, the B cell receptor in that CDRs one and two are encoded by the V segment that is chosen. And CDR three is made by the junction um, that is made during the VDJ recombination join. So you can see where we would map um, CDRs 1, 2, and 3 in the T cell receptor. Um, these are not the same gene segments as in the B cells. So basically, we've got some immunoglobulin gene segments on some chromosome and some TCR gene segments on another chromosome. But it's the same process and the same general setup that we see happening here. And this is sort of our simplified version of um, both of the alpha and the beta loci. And so you can see alpha here, um, a bunch of Vs, a bunch of Js. It's our light chain. We've got a constant region. Woohoo! Um, when I was in graduate school and I was TAing this class or a version of this class, um, often on exam two, we would put kind of an annoying um, VDJ recombination question. Because we were like, no, it, the same thing you already learned still applies here. So we're going to ask you this question, even though we didn't go over it again in class. I'm not going to be that mean, but know that everything we talked about with VJ recombination still applies here. <laughs> um, with the beta section, one thing that's really strange about beta is that there are actually two places where we have the constant region for beta um, and two sort of Vs and J regions and then just sort of the one D. So you can kind of see there's a couple different regions of some of these. Um, and in fact, each beta can actually try to recombine twice. So beta has two tries um, with the uh, Ds and Js 
that are next to each constant region. So that's one kind of unique thing about um, the T-cell receptor. But the more unique thing is shown on this previous slide. And suddenly, the reason why I harped on something that might not have seemed as important before will make sense of why it's important. Um, so we also have the 1223 rule in T-cells. And this shows the RSSs on some of the segments that are in the T-cell receptor. Um, you can see the brown is the 23 base pair RSS, the yellow is the 12 base pair RSS. There's a difference in the setup that you see here in T-cells compared to what you saw in B-cells. So what's different here? If I were going to draw the setup in B cells, what would I draw differently? Yeah, Sebastian. Yeah, so in B cells, when we look at the heavy chain, Sorry, ITAM. Okay, so this is what the locus looked like in B cells. This is what the locus looks like in T cells. So notice that here we have things set up a little differently. D now has different RSSs on either side, whereas in B cells, D had the same RSSs on both sides. So good news, the 1223 rule still holds here. V can go with D, D can go with J, like all looks good. But there's a bit of a complication that can happen in this situation. So if you actually look at the T cell setting, there are two things that you might imagine could happen here. So what are the two things that could happen here that can't happen there? Yeah, Addie. Yeah, so one of the things that you can have So one of the things that could theoretically happen here is you could pair a V to a J and you could skip the D with the RSSs in this configuration, which you couldn't do with the, the B cell configuration. It turns out that T cells don't do this. T cells do not skip D. They always have V, then D, then J. We don't know why. We don't know how they know to always include D. It is theoretically possible that they could skip D, just as Addie points out, and we don't know why they don't. There's one other thing that can happen in the T cell setup that um, cannot happen in the B cell setup. Yeah, Jamie. Go for it. Nope, so it wouldn't, it isn't going to lose J. Sebastian. Yeah, so the other thing that happened that can happen in the case of T cells is you can actually have a D join with a D. The, so you could put this D with this D. That's called a DD fusion. 
And in fact, DD fusions do happen in T cells. So T cells do have this additional thing that they can do that will allow them to um, get even more diversity, which is have DD fusions. Um, and this is all based on the 1223 rule and the setup of RSSs. Yeah, Jamie. Inversional joining can happen, yes. Um, so all of this is sort of pretty similar to what we've seen so far in terms of VUJ recombination. All of it kind of follows from things we've already learned. Um, one other thing that I will just point out is that alpha does have the ability to um, try to recombine multiple times to make a productive locus. This is not something that will happen to avoid self-reactivity. This simply is to make a functional alpha protein. When we get to the tolerance piece, when we get to the how we avoid self-reactivity, there's no more rearranging. The rearranging all happens first. So we are not looking at self-reactivity here. But alpha can sometimes rearrange um, multiple times to try to make a productive protein. Also, super weirdly, um, about 20% of T cells do not have perfect allelic exclusion at alpha. So some T cells make more than one alpha chain. Um, alpha seems to not allelically exclude perfectly. So that's annoying. Um, and so altogether, we can use sort of all the same types of phenomena that you saw before to give us our diversity of T cells, um, as a in, uh, just like you saw with B cells. So we've got lots of B segments, Ds and Js. We can have P and N nucleotides with our junctional diversity. We're pairing uh, the heavy and light chains, the alpha and the beta chain. All that good stuff gets us to huge numbers of T cells. And we can look at this table that we were looking at before and see places where the uh, T cells um, and B cells are doing things similar or differently. So both of them use multiple Bs, Ds, and Js. Both of use, them use light chains. Both of them use heavy chains. Both of them require RAG. Both of them put in P and N nucleotides. Only T cell receptor can do this DD fusion thing. Um, B cells are really good at allelic exclusion. T cells are a little imperfect at alpha. The T cell receptor, however, is not ever secreted in the way that the antibody is secreted. So we don't worry about any of those secretion splicing changes. The constant region doesn't really tell us anything about the function. And we're not going to have any changes later. The T cell is not going to do any hypermutation or any change to its receptor later. Um, and so this sort of table, this is a nice table that kind of compares and contrasts everything that we've seen. So in this way, it seems like VDJ and T cells, rather straightforward. Makes sense. But I've been skipping a part. And this part is where things get a little annoying. So I've already told you that there are lots of different types of T cells. Um, and we can subdivide our T cells in a number of different ways. There are actually two types of T cells in terms of the T cell receptor. One type of T cell is known as an alpha beta T cell. An alpha beta T cell has T cell alpha a TCR alpha chain and a TCR beta chain. The other type of T cell is called a gamma delta T cell. Gamma delta T cell uses a gamma chain and a delta chain instead of an alpha chain and a beta chain. And so because there are, these, there are in fact these four options for the chains, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, there's an additional complication of TCR rearrangement that comes up, which is kind of in how the cell is making 
alpha beta versus gamma delta, how the cell is sort of choosing alpha beta versus gamma delta. Um, most T cells, the vast majority of T cells, if you ever hear an immunologist say, you know, T cells, they mean alpha betas. Alpha betas are sort of the main standard T cells. Gamma deltas are a kind of strange subset of T cells um, that do some unique things and act in unique ways. Um, we now know a lot more about gamma deltas than we used to. When I first learned immunology, we pretty much learned about gamma deltas um, in this section where we talked about recombination for gamma delta, and then we never heard of them again because um, we didn't know enough about what they did. So I'm going to say a little more about them than that, but um, not a whole lot. On a previous slide, I showed you this, oops, this, where I showed you the alpha and the beta loci, and I said they were simplified. Because in reality, there is this complication with gamma and delta. Um, so here you can kind of see some simple pieces of gamma and delta. So what you can notice is that beta is a heavy chain. So beta has a V, a D, and a J. Alpha is a light chain. It has a V and a J. Gamma is also a light chain. It has a V and a J. And delta is a heavy chain. It has a V, a D, and a J. So in we can either have alpha beta, which will give us both a light chain and a heavy chain, or gamma delta, and that will give us a light chain and a heavy chain. So that part, straightforward. On the next slide, I'm going to show you kind of the thing. When you, it, and I, this is going to show you some data from both mouse and human. The thing I want you to be looking at here is what is true in both species. There's something else that always stands out to people, but it's only true in one species. I want the thing that's true in both species. So this shows you which chromosome all of these gene segments are on. So all of the V's and J's of alpha are on human chromosome all of the V's, D's, and J's of TCR beta are on human chromosome 7. All of the V's and J's of gamma are on human chromosome 7. And all of the V's, D's, and J's of TCR delta are on human chromosome 14. You can see the mouse chromosomes here as well. So what? stands out here when you look at these data. Yeah, Karen. Uh, the alpha and the delta. So in fact, the fact that it's 14 is less important than the fact that alpha and delta are on the same chromosome in, both, in all these cases. So alpha and delta are on the same chromosome. That's nice. That's interesting. But it's actually more than that. So if you actually look at these loci, this is what you see. So here in the middle, we've got the beta locus, the TCR beta locus. We've got the Bs, D, J. It's weird because it has like two D, J segments, two constants, but it kind of makes sense. OK, so there's that heavy chain. OK, fine. So here is gamma. Pretty standard light chain. It's got some Bs and some Js. Can handle gamma. Then we come up to this one. Here are all of the V alphas. So you can see V alpha. We got V alpha one, V alpha two, V alpha to however many. And then suddenly we have V deltas. And then we have the D deltas. And then we have the J deltas. And the constant region delta. And then, oh wait, no, we're going back to alphas again. So we have the J alphas and the C alpha. 
So in fact, the entire delta heavy chain locus is in the middle of the alpha light chain locus. So as you can see, delta is in the middle of alpha. This leads to a really big complication. Let's imagine that you were a T cell and you said, I really want to be an alpha beta T cell when I grow up. You need to then do rearrangement of beta and do rearrangement of alpha. Yeah? Okay, so let's imagine you do rearrangement of beta and rearrangement of alpha. And then imagine that you say, actually, I'm not sure about this anymore. I think I actually want to be a gamma delta instead. If you've become an alpha beta, if you have made an, uh, alpha and beta chains, can you become a gamma delta? No, why not? Yes. Yeah. So if you are ever going to re if you ever rearrange alpha, you have to delete the entire delta locus. And so rearranging alpha means delta is no longer a choice. And you can see that here as well. The entire delta locus is between all of the V alphas and the J alphas. Um, so that if you ever make an alpha chain, you have deleted all of delta, and so that delta is no longer a choice. And so in the process of T cells developing, sort of choosing between the alpha beta life and the gamma delta life, usually known as alpha beta lineage or gamma delta lineage, um, is a key piece of that process. And so these are two of the many types <laughs> of T cells that exist. After we talked about the details of VDJ recombination, we saw Reg1 and Reg2 and Artemis and all that business when we talked about B cells. Where did we go next? Yeah, Jamie. Mm, a little bit before that, but I, it makes sense why you're sort of, it feels a little sketchy right here. So remember, first we talked about just like the events of the DNA. And then we said, let's look at those events in a cell. And so we looked at B cell development. And so we saw the, uh, those events happening in what order they happened in, how we controlled them in B cell development. I've just told you basically all of the parallels for T cells and VDJ. And so in fact, the next place we're going is T cell development and how T cell development works and how we can order and time all of these events. How does the cell time alpha versus delta versus beta versus gamma? How does the cell choose which of, which of these things to do and the order in which to do them? And then the next thing that the cell will do after all of that recombination, Jamie, is then we're going to go into self-tolerance. Um, so one thing that is a little bit different with T cells as opposed to B cells is that both of those processes of T cell development and T cell selection occur in the thymus. In the case of B cells, everything that we saw was happening in the bone marrow. Um, our T cell progenitors do come from the bone marrow, but then they leave, but they leave the bone marrow and go to the thymus, um, which you have seen in your mouse, and which is different than a thyroid. And so you can see the thymus just sitting here uh, on top of the heart. So all of the events that we're going to be seeing here are happening um, in the thymus. Um, you can also see um, that the thymus just like the bone marrow, has sort of an ordered structure inside it. So we have um, 
an area called the cortex, an area called the medulla. Um, the cells are going to come in and uh, sort of interact um, and act in different ways um, to go through T cell development. So some stages will happen in different parts, either the cortex or the medulla. Um, I found this sort of thing really confusing um, as an undergrad because what I didn't understand for the longest time, and I was working in a lab that actually part of the lab worked on the thymus. And I was baffled about this until like for a really long time. Was I kind of imagined the thymus looking kind of like the target logo. Like there was the outside and that was the cortex and then there was the inside and that was the medulla and it was sort of just like that. It's actually not what it looks like. Um, so the thymus has areas of cortex and areas of medulla kind of sprinkled throughout. So there are, you can see some areas of um, cortex here. You can see areas of medulla. They look, you can see pretty different under a microscope, particularly with this staining. Um, they are full of a whole of developing T cells, thymocytes, because they're in the thymus. We got a lot of thymocytes, but those thymocytes are also making a lot of interactions with the structural cells of the thymus, who are giving them the little pats on the head, just like the B cells were getting the pats on the head as they were developing. When you look at the cortex and the medulla under a microscope, you can see the, how they do look pretty different in terms of their, their coloration um, with this. Honestly, the, that difference is really all about cell density. The purpley part, the cortex, has way more cells than the medulla. The cells are way more crowded in the cortex than the medulla. And as we go through some details of T cell development next time, you'll see why. They're super crowded. This is like, imagine Penn Station on like a super crowded, you know that super crowded day of Penn Station where you come up off the train and you're like, I can't move right now? That's what the cortex is like. And the medulla is like walking around Drew's empty campus. Okay, like that's, that's the difference really in terms of what you're seeing right here. Um, and note that the ability of those cells of the thymus to um, interact uh, with developing thymocytes is key for those developing thymocytes to develop, to actually do their development. In the lab that I worked in as an undergrad, like I said, part of uh, what they were working on was aspects of thymus biology. And they had a huge bank of samples of thymuses that had been cut out of people and put in the freezer. Freeze, we had this giant freezer full of people's thymuses. And you might be like, that's weird. Why are, why are there all of these thymuses being cut out of people? But in fact, the thymus is routinely removed in a, a certain surgeries um, because it can obscure the heart. And so in general, if someone has cardiac surgery, they just cut the thymus off because um, it's in the way. Um, and now you're all looking horrified at me. Personally, I do find it a little horrifying, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but there's a reason why it is people think that this is okay. Or why sort of the, the, the medical textbooks tell you this is okay. And the piece of information about that is here, which is that if you look at the number of T cells that are coming out of the thymus at different years of life, the thymus produces fewer and fewer T cells over time. So you make a lot of T cells early in life, and as you get older, you make fewer and fewer. And so sometimes textbooks say the thymus stops working at age 10. And so you can just cut it out because it doesn't matter. Um, that's not true. It keeps work It works less. It does work less. But it still does keep working. Um, but in fact, even 
with um, pediatric heart surgery, the thymus comes out um, because it is in front of the heart. Um, when and, and so the thymus does decrease quite a bit in, t in terms of its uh, output over time. This is actually the thymus of a young um, person. This is the thymus of an older person. And what has happened is actually that fat cells have invaded into the thymus um, and removed sort of some of that surface for developing T cells to interact. So the problem is you don't have all of the thymus structure cells for the developing T cells to interact with because of the fat cells coming in. This is known as thymic involution. Um, I actually, that actually matters a lot when I'm setting up our experiments with the mice. I have to pick mice of a certain age. If I get, if our mice are too old, you actually won't be able to take their thymus out um, because it will be so fatty, it will fall apart when you try to touch it. Um, and so generally, whenever we understand aspects of the thymus, we are understanding it in younger individuals because it decreases in uh, how it works over time. Although I think that the case is often overstated that it just stops, which is very much not the case. Um, and the thymus is still uh, ongoing. Um, however, you do make a lot of T cells really early in life. Um, there are also um, some autoimmune diseases that can be treated uh, by thymectomy, um, by removal of the thymus. Um, the next slide is super fun. I'm going to mention it to you, freak you out, and then we'll actually get into the details of it for next time. Um, which is just that there is a, there are mice that have a genetic defect, so they don't have a thymus. These are called nude mice. They also don't have hair. I can talk about why that is next time. There are also people who don't have thymuses. Um, they have a disease called DeGeorge syndrome. They do have hair. Just because you don't have a thymus doesn't mean you don't have hair. The two things are unrelated in the mouse. So we'll talk about, the, we'll talk about nude mice um, who have no hair, and also, more importantly to us, no thymus, um, starting next time. And we will be talking about T cell development. Just so you know, I think I showed you on the first day um, an article from The Atlantic by Ed Yong, who's one of my favorite science writers, that was called something to the effect of immunology is where intuition goes to die. Um, T cell development is one of the places where that hits hard. So just be ready for a, something where you're like, no, that is the dumbest thing. I Like, no, that should not be how it works. I promise it is, I pro but I promise it's also probably going to feel uncomfortable a little bit. So just be ready for that. <laughs>